So thank you all for being here. Um, early in the year, we decided, looked at what, what topics, what issues can we talk about that would help inform uh, the voters, help inform our electorate. And so economy came up. That was a popular one. Well, that's a huge topic. It's ginormous. <laughs> so as we started trying to narrow it down with uh, Carlene and, and uh, Alan and some others, uh, we came across the idea of looking at this topic in terms of education, but not just education, uh, early childhood education. Now, if you're like me, you are very concerned about our economy. Well, anybody who lives in New Mexico pretty much has that concern. What about our economy? And what I have heard for years, being a native of New Mexico, is jobs. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Let's get jobs here. So, you know, elected officials, get jobs here. Come on, get jobs here. And what I've heard also from being in some of those rooms where these things are talked about is that really education is the backbone, and that's the key. And when we look at our uh, state, there's a lot of different components to this cycle, right? We, we talk about crime. Well, well, crime also has to do with education. We talk about the economy. The economy has to do with education. There's health. I mean, there's just this, this cycle. And, and how do we interrupt that cycle? Well, I believe that this topic that we're going to be listening to and learning about tonight is a, it, it's, as Marie will talk about, evidence-based way to interrupt that cycle. And so thank you for being here to learn about this, to arm yourselves with information, because it's our job not only to go and take this to the ballot box in November, but to help our neighbors and friends, our precinct members, as we go, as we talk on the phone, as we knock on these doors, help people to be informed as well. So this is a, a great topic. Thank you for being here. Thank you for paying attention. Um, I'd like for Mo, if you would, please come up and, and tell us a little. Oh, I'm sorry. Damon. Hi, Mo. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Damon, uh, would you like to come up and say a couple of words? Hi, Mo. This is my brother, Mo. Um, so I'm actually here for Stephanie. Um, she was our colleague. She's wonderful. Um, I can't wait to hear what she's going to say. And maybe a little bit from my brother, Mo. <laughs> maybe a little bit. So it'll be good. So thank you very much for having me. And I look forward to listening to you guys. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for all you do. Okay. So real quickly, let's take out the program here. Karen. Oh, Karen. Karen, where's Karen? I don't see Karen. Okay, well, let's, let's start on this and then uh, we can go. So, first question here. Nationally, by 2050, a universal pre-kindergarten program will yield what in benefits? Anybody? Um, the biggest number. That's right. $304.7 billion in benefits. Next one, every dollar invested in early childhood education yields this return on investment. Actually, depends on the study, depends on the program. Nevertheless, between $4.60 and $17 per dollar invested. So that is pretty darn good. Uh, so it's a good return on our investment. Okay, how many years does it take for benefits of early childhood education to exceed the costs? Anybody? Um, Sue? B. Anybody else? A. A. It's B. Eight years. Yeah. In eight years, the benefits will exceed the cost. <laughs> Demi, no cheating. <laughs> okay, let's look at the other side. Now, you know, at the top of this other page, we see as Democrats, we voted on a platform. And uh, so on, at the criminal, criminal justice reform, 
under that uh, part of the platform, it says instead of investing in more jails and incarceration, we need to invest in more in jobs and education for incarcerated and for the average citizen and end the school to prison pipeline. So that's the other side of the equation. Let's, rather than looking at you know, third grade reading scores and saying, okay, let's see how many prisons we need to build. That, that's a, you know, yeah, we could just keep on doing that. But how about we say, you know, for every dollar we invest, we can have a beautiful return, not only in health, but in happiness of our society. So looking at the 2015 cost of confining one youth per year in New Mexico, it was A, B, C, or D. Cheryl. Oh, you know what? I'm going to let Marie take this one because she's actually, this is part of her presentation. So you're going to have to hold on to that one. And you're going to have to hold on to the next one too, the average lifetime cost. She's going to be covering that one. And this goes down to New Mexico has one of the highest rates of uh, students being held back a grade in addition to negatively impacting a child's self-esteem. What is the cost to the state? Like a one-time cost? Yes. Well, the total Total cost. It's actually C, $5,000, okay? Okay, what percentage of New Mexican fourth graders are not proficient in reading? C, C, 77%. And what percentage of New Mexican eighth graders are not proficient in math? D, 79%. And early childhood education can make a difference in those numbers. So with that, I would like to turn this over to Marie Lobo. Marie is a nurse uh, let me, with a whole bunch of beautiful uh, initials behind her name. And, and she does wonderful work for our community and she works with the Nurse Family Partnership and we are so proud that she is also a West Side Dem. So thank you, Marie. You can tell I'm short. I'm always moving the microphone down. So I'm going to be talking today um, about evidence-based programs. Um, interestingly enough, we started the day, and, and my background is, I'm a, I have a PhD in nursing science, but I've been working with uh, health policy and home visiting for the last 40 years. I hate, it sounds so long. Um, so this, this is in my area of expertise. The, um, we're going to be talking about evidence-based programs, and we had an, an example of a non-evidence-based program on our front page of the Albuquerque Journal today. Anybody guess what it is? How about art? A whole bunch of money went in to Central Avenue without a lot of planning and thought, and that's a lack of evidence um, makes a difference. So um, how many of you have heard of DARE? Okay, it's a, drug, it's a drug education program that's goal was to stop uh, and decrease drug use in adolescence. It was implemented in middle school. Now, most of you probably have not heard about the Nurse Family Partnership. This is an evidence-based program with about four, almost 40 years of evidence behind it. And I'm going to use it as an example of a program that works. So <clears throat> what does evidence-based decisions mean? And we need to make our evidence-based decisions for policy if we're going to have policies that are effective and that give us long-term outcomes. I love playing with a new piece of equipment. I just have to figure out how it works. <laughs> so <clears throat> one of the things that we're, we're looking at is DARE is an evidence-based program. The evidence showed that it didn't work. That it, <laughs> and so we quit investing money in it. We quit putting money in it. Nurse Family Partnership, on the other hand, has a lot of evidence that shows that it works. It's a program that's implemented from the 24th week of pregnancy through two years. It improves school readiness. It increases immunization rates. It has a decrease in child abuse. It decreases encounters with the criminal justice system in high school. They have a higher rates of high school graduation. 
They also have, a, it also, one of the most recent studies, it has a positive effect on the epigenetics. So we talk a lot how bad experiences in childhood, adverse childhood effects, events affect your genes. This is a program that improves your genes rather than harms them. By taking an approach where we use evidence to make our decisions, we have, um, we reduce wasteful spending, like we quit putting money into DARE because it didn't work. We expand innovative programs. Nurse Family Partnership is an example. It's been expanding all over the country. And we strengthen accountability. So we keep evaluating these programs so that we know um, what, what their effects are and are we implementing them in a way that's consistent with the way the program was developed. So when you're making an evidence-based decision, you need to look at the source of the information you're using. So it should be, the studies that have been done about it should be defined, they should have a defined prop question that's being answered. It can't be, oh, you know, Aunt Susie has a daycare and her kids are always ready for school. That isn't the evidence that you need. You need studies that are rigorous. They use rigorous research methods that have been established by the scientific community. They require multiple studies of the same topic. So for example, on the Nurse Family Partnership, there's over 40 published studies over the last 35 to 40 years that show the evidence of how that program makes an impact on the lives of children and families. And those studies are published in peer-reviewed journals. And that means that somebody with similar expertise reviewed the, the science and the findings to say, yes, this, this, is, this makes sense, it's logical. It's not a self-published handbook that says, gee, Marie Lobo developed this home visiting program and we're gonna implement it because she said it has good outcomes. So when we're talking about evidence-based policy making, we're talking about using those kind of findings to determine where we're gonna spend our money, where we're gonna spend our public money. The ACA had, um, the Affordable Care Act had evidence-based policy making in programs that they recommended for teen pregnancy prevention, as well as for early home visiting. And initially, this is where policy and politics inter intertwine. Initially, they were only going to fund the Nurse Family Partnership, but the politics of states that had other programs meant they also funded promising programs. So when you're looking at the evidence-based policy making, you have to look at both the gaps and, the, and what supports that program. And when you're doing this, so I'm going to talk about the cost effectiveness of early home visiting. I know we have a lot of discussion about the use of uh, pre-K programs. However, pre-K programs, um, the kids have already spent three or four years with their parents and an early home visiting program helps improve that home environment and parenting skills. This is the kind of chart that a policymaker would make, would develop, and it has the list of different programs down the left side, and then it talks about the quality of the studies and whether or not they have long-term impact. What this chart doesn't say, which some others do, is how long the impact lasts. Some programs, they only have an impact until the program ends. You can see improvements, then the program ends and you don't see any retention of those. Other programs, you might see it for a year or two. Nurse Family Partnership shows improvements into adulthood, shows an effect into adulthood. And it also has an impact on the parents. One of the things it's shown is it delays the second pregnancy and that makes a huge difference in the quality of the home environment. So if you have a single case of child abuse that, that ends in death, the average cost is $1.3 million. Think about what Victoria Martin's case has cost already. Not, that's not even counting who's gonna end up in jail and all of those costs. And the average cost, <clears throat> the lifetime cost of a child abuse which does not result in death is $210,000. So by pre preventing a single case of child abuse, you 
pay a, you save a considerable amount of money. And when you look at these programs on scale, they save multiple cases of child abuse. And that's where you get the savings down the road. The cost of youth confinement in New Mexico is $182,000 a year. That's each youth. And think about, we're, we're using these for-profit jails and all of this stuff, how much of that money really goes to working with the child and trying to imp improve so that you don't have, improve that child's behavior so that you don't have recidivism and, when they get out of jail and how much is going to some for-profit group. So the cost benefit of nurse family partnership, depending on the study you look, uh, look at, um, the one that's used most often is for every dollar invested, you get a $5.70 return. The LFC did a study that showed that in New Mexico, you get a $10 return for every dollar invested. And the net benefit to society is over $34,000 a year. And that includes things like decrease in welfare use, increase in employment, increased school completion, uh, those kinds of social issues. And your best investment is targeting mothers who have the most social needs. So delivering this program to the most at risk is going to have the most bang for your bucks. If you're delivering it to somebody who has a lot of social support and has a lot of family support, there it's not going to have as great an impact as with a teenage girl who's been kicked out of her house because she turned out pregnant. So the savings also um, comes because you have increased tax revenues because people are more likely to be employed uh, as if they participated in this program. So I'm going to turn this, this is just, that's a quick overview. If you have any questions about evidence-based policy making, I'll be glad to answer questions after we're done. Um, <laughs> Oh, yes. And then um, each panel member, it's four minutes, right? That's what you, okay. Each panel member has four minutes and I'm going to use the timer. Um, and I'm really good at, I don't care that you're a politician. I will still <laughs> tell you, you have to stop talking. Um, you can catch me. <laughs> <laughs> you would be amazed at some of the very prominent nurses that I've stopped talking, so I could probably do it. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to let our panel, my panel members introduce themselves and um, then they'll each get four minutes to, to talk about their areas of expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Is this on? It's on already? Thank you. Thank you so very much. My name is uh, Antonio uh, Maestas or Mo Maestas. I represent District 16, which uh, is just south of here from Central to Montano. My big bill I've been pushing the last <clears throat> couple, three, four years is uh, House Joint Resolution 1, which proposes to put on the ballot a constitutional amendment which would take 1% from the land grant permanent fund into early childhood education. So I'll be talking about the solvency of the fund and why that's a good idea. And I have a, I live right there on Jones Street, just north of Western Trail, and have a 16-year-old, a 4-year-old, and a 3-year-old. Hello everyone, I'm Stephanie Garcia Richard. I'm your Democratic nominee for State Land Commissioner, which is the office that oversees and draws revenue into the fund that my good colleague was just uh, referring to. Um, and believe it or not, I don't actually think I need four minutes either. I always make a joke that if I had 90 seconds with every voter I need in New Mexico, I would have it done. But it is my great privilege to be here with this gentleman who has spent probably most of his career in politics fighting uh, for universal access to early childhood education for every family in New Mexico who wants it. And that is the tagline of my campaign for land commissioner. We have never had in the history of the land office a land commissioner come and advocate on behalf of early childhood. They're always stingy and don't let us take the money. So uh, I am a native New Mexican. I know about the challenges we face firsthand because I'm a mother and an educator but I've also have family members who have experienced cyclical violence, generational poverty, a lot of the uh, impacts and effects that, that Marie was talking about, and this is our silver bullet, folks, as close as we can come to one. So uh, I need your help to get elected, 
and this guy get elected and that guy get elected so we can pass the um, constitutional amendment and you all can vote on it on the ballot. Thank you. What's your, my... I gave her 30 seconds. What's your current position and how long have you been there? Where you oh, my current position is I am the chair, the proud chair of the House Education Committee. Um, and I've been in public education for 18 years and I've served in the state legislature for six years. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Kathy Sanchez Preisler. I usually go by Kathy Sanchez, so uh, it's great to be here. And uh, I have to really commend you all. I was here during your meeting, and uh, I think it's awesome what you're doing. I've heard a little bit about you all through Marie. Marie and I have worked together for the last six years. And uh, I work in pediatrics, but this evening I'm really here as a child advocate. I don't represent where I work. Um, but uh, I've been working in pediatrics for over six years. And uh, my role is, is really grassroots. I work on the ground with families, with providers. I do a lot of work with home visiting programs. We have 11 different home visiting programs in Bernalillo County alone. And uh, I'll tell you more about them when it's my turn. But uh, I'm, also a, I'm also a student. Oh yeah, okay. I'm also a student uh, learning uh, more about maternal child health. It's a graduate program in public health. So I'm a, I'm a huge public health uh, advocate and uh, means I, I believe in prevention. I believe in promotion and prevention. And um, let me ask you all a question. Wh where does New Mexico stand uh, with child wellness? Can anybody tell me? Yeah. Yes. So. I think we're behind now. So, so we have a long way to go, and uh, I'm excited about the panel this evening because I, I know they're also advocates for prevention. And one of, the, one of the pieces that I discovered early in my job as I went about, see, because I work with prenatal to three years, four years of age, and uh, I've given classes, brain development classes, to families, directly to parents, directly to child care providers, and uh, pediatricians as well. I, I do some training with new resident doctors that come through my office. And uh, it's all about prevention, all about home visiting. And um, who can tell me what is the most crucial age for brain development? Zero to three. Prenatal. Prenatal? Yes, and uh, how much are we doing for prenatal to three in this, in this state, in this country? How much are we doing? Not enough. Not enough. We're investing more in, in, in foster care or we're very reactive when a child abuse case has surfaced. But when it comes to prevention, there's very few of me. I mean, I have to, I have to rely, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a staff of one and I rely on mostly volunteers. And uh, Marie is part of a group that I organize called the Bernalillo County Home Visiting Work Group. And when I initially uh, became part of that group and, and started to lead that group, there were only like five of us. And uh, right now, we average between 30 to 40. Dr. Chilton was in our last meeting. And, uh, and I'll tell you, one of the reasons why we every month we have early childhood folks coming together, exchanging information, wanting to help each other. You know why? Because we have to. And uh, in, in, in the research that I've done with systems, with uh, prenatal care, for example, it, it's not always clear and easy for families to know where to go to get help. We have a lot of uh, teens that that uh, end up pregnant. We don't do enough around reproductive health. And then when they're pregnant, they, they hold it. They don't want to tell anybody. We work with some schools where, where we do some outreach around home visiting and, and support systems that will help them. Your time's up. Oh, is I it? told you I'd stop people. Oh, can I just have 30 seconds? I guess so, since okay. the, others, the others seated you sometimes. Okay, so, so the group that I organize is doing a job that we need our systems to do better, and that's the coordination 
of services and information. Families go all over this city, and I imagine in rural areas, it's probably even harder, where they have to search high and low for prenatal care. They stumble across the information in the back table about uh, home visiting, and, uh, and then you have DOH, all the different departments, state departments that don't work together. And uh, maybe some of them work together. I shouldn't be generalized, but we need more collaboration at the state level. I, I think one of the things that Kathy sort of touched on is CYFD, DOH, and Department of Education. Did I miss anybody? Those three have, all have multiple early home visiting programs. Who else? Did I miss somebody? Education. HSD, Education. And PED is, is mostly uh, pre-K, three and four-year-olds. And there is, at the state level, there is little to no coordination among those programs. Bernalillo County, under Kathy's leadership, is considered a model for the state of how to work together. And one of the other pieces that they do is share continuing education programs so that if one of the programs is bringing in a speaker, they share it with the other programs to maximize the benefits. So the quest, so have you got your questions written? Or did the, I'm ready for questions. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry, what did you tell them, Laura? <laughs> she, she arranged this. I thought the four minutes. I have questions. If you guys have Wait. questions, please write them down and hand them to me or Jimmy. Okay, well, wait, let them go ahead. I'm confused, um, excuse me. I thought they had 40, only four minutes to present. Okay. And then we'll be collecting questions while you're doing that. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I had four minutes was the presentation. That's why I just yeah. said hi. Oh, yeah. I, I could do it in two. Okay. Go for Thank it. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Go ahead and use the microphone. I'm trying to find the recorder on my phone. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to try not to bore you, but it's, it's exciting stuff. Uh, and then I'll segue it over to Representative Garcia Richard, um, New Mexico has, as a state government, all of us uh, own 9 million surface acres of land. We also own 13 million mineral acres. So someone owns the surface, but we own the minerals underneath it. And so what happened was when the, when the revolutionaries took over, Thomas Jefferson was a surveyor. He created the Surveyors Act so that all these huge tracts of land headed west are surveyed into, uh, into a township. And in those townships, there's 33 sections. And they're each numbered. Uh, 36, forgive me, 36 sections. They're all numbered uh, uh, with one in the upper right and then goes down to the lower left. But anyway, because of the Ferguson Act in 1898, the Enabling Act in 1910, New Mexico, when it became a state, was granted, granted it was ours, First, but it was granted all this land from the federal government to manage to essentially uh, pay for, for governmental services. This was before we had a public uh, education system, before there was a personal income tax. I mean, it was a different time. Oil was then discovered in 1927. Uh, and so what happens is, if I'm an oil company, Mo Oil, and I know there's oil on that track of land, then I go to the state land office I lease that land from the state land office. So the land grant permanent fund is all the money that originally derived from the land. And it's now invested primarily in global stocks. It is now somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 billion with a B, 18 billion dollars. It has grown six billion dollars in the past five years. Um, and so this money, 5% uh, of a rolling average goes into the state's general fund that goes into K through 12. So every G December 31st, whatever the fund is on that date, then that's a variable in the five-year rolling average. So you take December 31st from 
2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, and then you, and then when we go into the session in January of 19, we're given a number that then goes in. The fund is not a 5% distribution. Because it's a rolling average of the five preceding years, it's more like a 4.2 rolling average. My proposal is to take 1% off the top of $18 billion and put it into early childhood education. An additional 1%. So the five would remain an additional 1%. Yes, thank you. And so they always say, well, you can't take more than five, you can't take more than five. We can take more than five for three reasons. One, because we're not distributing five, we're distributing 4.2. Two, our fund grows two ways. It grows through financial investments, approximately 8% a year. This last year it grew like 13%. But unlike any other fund in the country, maybe the world, it also grows through these royalties, these oil and gas and mineral royalties uh, that comes in forms of cash inflows from the state land office. The State Investment Council manages these, this fund, does a tremendous job, and so we can handle an additional 1% distribution because we not only grow through financial investments but through oil mineral royalties from the state land office. Also, in 2014, you all passed a constitutional amendment which there was a 15% cap on international investments, which essentially created two portfolios. We removed that cap, and now they can move millions, tens of millions of dollars across international borders with the push of a button. That's why they're getting incredibly high returns, even more so than the average investor who has, you know, 5,000 bucks in the stock market or whatever. The, this money, um, so we can handle the additional 1%, it has to pass the House, which it has the past couple of years. It needs to pass the Senate and then go to the voters. And that money, uh, it has 21 beneficiaries that benefit from the fund. 85% of the fund is for public education. So that additional 1% is essentially 85% of that 1% would go into early childhood programs without raising a dime in taxes. And it would be approximately $150 million a year for our young people, which would come back, as we learn, tenfold throughout the course of their life. Thank you. Wonderful. That's why the state land office is so important, and that we have, that that we, that we keep our. But besides the, the gov, this office is the number one office we need to keep our eye on, and we need. Stephanie, to be the land commissioner. Thank you. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. So this is um, the office that funds public education. We have never had an educator sit in this office, manage this fund, draw revenue for education, someone who knows what's at stake with each and every dollar. I was actually still in a classroom when the bottom went out of the economy. I know what that's like, personally. So um, that is part of my impetus for wanting to run for this office so that I can maximize and diversify the revenue that my colleague was talking about. And the way I want to do that um, has, has a lot of different arms. Um, and I can, I can talk to you all about that if, you, if you'd like. But I would like to grow that revenue by diversifying into renewable energy, by holding the oil and gas uh, accountable. I believe that uh, you know, they are a boon for our states, certainly. I know that that's where my bread and butter comes from as a public uh, educator, but I don't believe they're paying their fair share of royalties. I don't believe they, uh, they I, I believe they're wasting money through releasing methane into the, into the air. And so I would like to further hold them uh, accountable to also increase revenue into the fund. Why? Why? What's the purpose of doing this? We have nationwide, I think we're serving now almost 50% of our four-year-olds not even close to that in three-year-olds. And home visiting, I'm not even sure what the percentage is, but it doesn't even come close. We want to provide access to all families, whether that be transportation, whether that be a qualified workforce, whether that be capital improvements, all of those pieces are components to a holistic um, early childhood education delivery system. And so that's what this money that, that Mo is talking about is to be used for, to, to, to grow up and make robust our early childhood education services for families in New Mexico. Because we know that our families, and like Kathy said, they are low on the list for uh, well-being. 
they have high incidences of what's called adverse childhood experiences. Those are known as ACEs. And according to how many ACEs a child experiences in their early development, that is directly correlated to their health, health outcomes later on. And education. Right. And education. And education outcomes. And criminal and uh, interactions with the criminal justice system, in fact. So we know that access to quality, evidence-based early childhood services will go a long way to reversing the impact of those ACEs on our New Mexico kids. That is the reason I need to be elected. Um, that is the reason we need to elect Democrats up and down that ticket. Uh, we want a governor who's out there, even though she doesn't have to sign this bill. We want a governor who's out there advocating and understanding the importance of this investment in our kids. I mean, I'm looking here at these costs. We don't even spend that much a year educating our kids. So, I mean, you know, the, 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 the difference between incarceration and education in, in terms of investment is, is vast. So, um, I believe that's all I wanted to say. I did want just to piggyback on your history lesson a little bit. We actually became a state at the same time Arizona did. They did not create an investment fund in Arizona. The revenue from state land there just goes straight to the beneficiaries. Here, uh, the way McCamley tells it on the campaign trail is we were a little bit too brown of a population to be trusted with our money, so it's invested in the state, uh, in the land grant permanent fund. I mean, it, that sword cuts two ways. There is another fund at the state land office. It's called the Land Management Fund, and that is funded through renewable revenue sources. So if we are to increase uh, renewable energy and the revenue from that, that money will go directly to beneficiaries. And I'm the gal to do it, folks. But I need your help. And my gal is telling me I need to ask you for your money and to sign up to volunteer in my campaign. So that's Sharon over there. If you want to give me money or sign up for my campaign, you can do it with her. And I can answer, uh, and I can answer Stephanie's question. About in, 20, in 2017, 4,587 children were served, families were served statewide for, with, home visiting. with home visiting. So what percentage of like two to three percent? Yeah, right? It's something, it's, in some places, it's So, and, what, and one of the interesting thing is, the, the, which is sort of a logical thing, the more rural this, this county is, the less likely there is to be services. Because it takes you further to get from place to place. And as you know, we have counties without health care providers and pharmacies and things like that. So anyway, Kathy. It, did you, you, do you have any more? Did, did you have more that you needed to present? No, I, I think made a great point about uh, evidence-based versus willy-nilly or, or whatever. I mean, we, we do a lot of great things in New Mexico, but when it comes to children and preventing child abuse, evidence-based is really the way to go. And uh, that married to the land-grant fund and, and having success with that would be, I mean, in my opinion, it's, it's what we need in New Mexico. Our children deserve the best. Kathy, can you tell us a little bit about your program and how it works? Like, can you give us a little bit of an example of what you do The type of work that I'm doing is, is organizing. Organizing early childhood providers to, to meet and know each other. Like, I have a list of 13 different programs in prevention that, are, that have home visiting and uh, bring them together so that they know each other. They have different eligibility requirements. So rather than one, like Nurse Family Partnership, you have to be 28 weeks or less pregnant and it has to be your first child. So if somebody is 30 weeks pregnant, Nurse, nurse Family Partnership can refer to St. Joe's, CHI St. Joe's or they could re refer to other programs. So the whole idea behind my program and the, and, the, and the group that I coordinate is to make sure that families who, who need services, who want services, don't fall through the cracks. So we self-organize uh, through this group and, and also organize with, with uh, for example, Roadrunner Food Bank. Make sure that those home visiting 
uh, home visitors know about WIC and, and you know all of the different uh, services that help families raise children. So we're doing a lot of coordination that's, uh, you know, that's at the grassroots, that's not funded. I mean, I'm funded to do it, but this is, a, this is an effort that really needs to be, be done at all levels, at the highest level, all the way to the grassroots, that schools, schools should have like early childhood hubs. This is, this is another thing that we're working on, our early childhood hubs that have information about uh, early, early brain development, uh, early childhood hub that has books. I know Dr. Chilton and his wife work a lot with promoting literacy. If we had more centers that promoted literacy, that offered information like what I have back there on home visiting and other zero to three services. So we do a lot of coordinating and uh, it's exasperating because we really don't have an entity in this state that promotes promotion. If we were more into public health, we would, we would have these early childhood hubs set up everywhere where families knew where to go to get information about prenatal care, to get access to books, to get access to uh, brain development, to get access to childcare, and what is high quality. So that's another thing that the group that I coordinate really emphasize to, to groups like you all and to political officials is know what high quality means. And uh, I think that's what, that was the point that Marie was trying to make around evidence-based. There's actually a document that you can Google under the Legislative Finance Committee. It's called Results First. It's a, a behavioral health initiative and they talk about what we need to do in New Mexico to, to provide better services, high quality services to rich and poor alike. The rich find high quality services, but the kids that are suffering the most are, are low income. Sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> the, the other piece of that uh, is that's where the, the data, the analysis of Nurse Family Partnership showed there was $10 return on every dollar invested. The other thing is, is that, for example, referring people who don't fit into NFP to St. Joe's it's not an, they use Firstborn, which is not an evidence-based program. It was developed in um, uh, southern, southwestern New Mexico. And because it's a homegrown program, people really like it. But the reality is that evidence isn't there to support the program. There's studies going on now. But when you already have a program that you know that works, invest your dollars where you're going to get your outcomes. So, um, mm -hmm. I think Kathy, there's a there's a couple of questions that kind of are the same, and and it's why why doesn't why don't the state programs for home visiting work together more, and can the legislature direct the agencies to work together? So there's a use that. There's been a. <clears throat> we'll see what the next governor has in store. This is probably going to be the, in addition to reorganizing CYFD whether we create a department of early childhood, whether we have a secretary of early childhood, whether we roll in the infrastructure consistent with PED and the equalization formula and the school system. I, I say we, we, we work with, we do with what works and right now that's heavy in the nonprofit sector, the nonprofit organizations providing these services, but we really need a governor in this state desperately. So January 1, we'll have a governor. We have clear. But I mean so, a governor, not just a new one, but a governor. <laughs> so how, how and will... And obviously we could do that in statute, but it's really the governor who, who's going to make the call on, on how do we manage and grow this system. Basically, Mo, if they win, Pierce will just veto whatever you do. Um, he'll tell us beforehand, unlike the current governor, so it's a, it's a step up from the current <laughs> governor. He'll like say, take that out and I won't veto it as opposed to, I, the reason I vetoed it because that was in, but it, everything's a step up, but, we, but yeah, if Pierce wins, um, it'll be much more difficult to, to grow this, this system. So how will you as a legislator and as land commissioner get around a certain Deming Democrat to pass a constitutional amendment resolution? 
We each have our own answers on that. Uh, <laughs> you let it he's, he's, got, he's got his strategy. Um, I, I believe that it is to take this campaign to the people of New Mexico because um, those are the folks who want to see the 1%. Uh, all of our public survey uh, results say that it's a very popular program and to have public put pressure, I think it'll change things to definitely have uh, a, a land commissioner advocating for instead of against. The land commissioner also sits on the State Investment Council. Um, which is something that Mo referred to as well and talks about, you know, investments. What are we going to invest that, that $18 billion in? Um, and so I think that having a pro-early childhood advocate in that role uh, will help, and Mo has his own strategies around that. No, thank you, and I'll touch on a, what may be the next question is, what's the argument against? What's the argument against? The argument against has changed through the years. Five years ago, it was because the, the fund couldn't handle it. Now they don't even try that argument. And then, uh, and then now they're kind of running out of arguments, so now it's just power politics. The Deming senator that was referenced in the, que in the question, as you all know, is uh, Senator John Arthur Smith, the very powerful uh, chair of Senate Finance. He has the confidence of the pro tem and the Senate. So the Senate, culturally, in my opinion, defers to Senate Finance on these financial issues, and the Senate Finance Committee defers to John Arthur Smith, and John Arthur Smith is wrong on the numbers. He's wrong. So unfortunately, he, doesn't, he hasn't given us a hearing in a couple of years. Uh, so we need to have that hearing and flesh it out. But we've spent a lot of time focusing on John Arthur. We need to focus on all 112 legislators, hold them all accountable. We need to focus on the gubernatorial candidates. Uh, next year should be a totally different issue because as uh, Representative Garcia Richard pointed out, School for the Blind, School for the Deaf, NIMI, state, New Mexico, they will all get a bump from 5% to 6%. So we'll have 20 or so uh, presidents or, and secretaries, Secretary of CYFD, Secretary of PET, all of these powerful people in those committees trying to pass the legislation as opposed to now trying to stop it. So the governor doesn't have a, uh, doesn't have a vote with the exception of at the general election, just like you all. We don't go to the governor be, to go to the people. We pass the House, Senate, we go to the people. So. Um, we're just gonna trust in the process. We're gonna we're gonna have a hearing, and we're gonna we're gonna get the votes to get it to the people. And actually, I had an opponent in the primary who always, um, previously, until this past primary, was against this proposal, and he made some statements during the primary, sort of coming around. And so that that kind of you know the political will and and us making it a little bit more political po politically popular. Um, I think, you know, that, that pushes on, on those yeah, folks. Yeah, pressure, politicians respond to pressure. And, and when we focused on John Arthur three, four years ago, the Senate kind of closed rank because it was, some of it was done in a very disrespectful way in terms of the decorum in Santa Fe. But instead of focusing on John Arthur, we just, we just focus on the entire state. Um, and then also, uh, Howie Morales was a seven or nine year member of Senate Finance. He knows the culture of that committee. He knows what's persuasive and what's not persuasive in that committee. And he will be our Lieutenant Governor, you know, if we do the work. So we, have, we will have a former Senate Finance member as our Lieutenant Governor. And, uh, and MLG will just be in John Arthur's office along with the two of us and, uh, <laughs> and we'll get it done. Um. You're, you're, on, you're, on, you're on film. We're used to being filmed, and you're going to be YouTubed, whatever you say. No, just keep, no please. Yes, Pete, by all means. So, uh, how, a more knowledgeable public... I'm making a comment there. A more knowledgeable public servant I do not know. So, how does New Mexico's land fund, land grant funds compare to other states? We the second largest, third largest, third largest in, the in the country. Yeah. yeah, we're the third largest in the country. Um, I think uh, Texas has a huge one. Alaska has a huge one. Harvard, Stanford, the, the, the private schools have 300-year endowments. Those funds grow strictly by financial investments, and our fund grows by financial investments as well as royalties. And I. Just to clarify, royalties from non-renewables. So if I'm an oil guy, my money, I lease the land, 
that money goes into the permanent fund and then it kicks back 5%. If it's wind, if it's non-renewable, wind, solar, then it would go from the land office straight into the general fund, straight into education today. And that's where uh, Stephanie comes in to, to build that fund, or not that fund, but to, to build that inflow of cash into the general fund. So what might a universal pre-K program look like and how would you make sure economically poor and at-risk kids get programs as good as kids with more resources? I actually work with, uh, I actually, my expertise is more prenatal to three, so. Do you, do you want to take the question? Because I, I can't, I can't honestly say what that would look like, except that everybody would have access. I, mean, right? I think who has more to gain is uh, tribal communities, and rural communities, and three, four years ago, that was the argument against. Well, it's all going to go to Albuquerque, Santa Fe. But, um, but it's just going to take leadership in building that infrastructure. Community colleges, speeding up the process with regards to certification of early childhood teachers, uh, encouraging our best and brightest to go into the field, uh, encouraging entrepreneurs to incorporate nonprofits and develop those programs, and, and having a governor and, and, and the leadership within state government, you know, building this capacity. Now, the argument is, well, we don't have the capacity. You know, it's not that the fund can't handle it or it's not a good idea, which were the arguments five, six years ago. Now it's like, oh, we, we don't have the capacity to grow that fast. That's the last argument that they throw out there. And actually, on that point of capacity, there is uh, sort of a business plan, business model being developed by one of what we call the early education funders. These are the nonprofit foundations that Mo is referring to um, that all, you know, participate actually statewide. Um, there, are, there are foundations that participate in providing early childhood education services in their communities. Uh, the Thornburg Foundation is taking the lead on this, and they're basically putting together a business plan and a roadmap for what I described earlier. Where do we have um, a need for training, you know, quality individuals? Uh, because uh, unfortunately, our early child care providers right now are sorely underpaid, um, and they really can't even afford to get better certification for themselves because they their salaries are so low. Um, so training salaries, transportation to nearby services. I love this idea of hubs. Um, and then the, the third would be capital. Where do we need to build because we don't have the actual buildings, um, the actual you know, uh, brick and mortar to provide the services. And, and I would love to see something that's very unified like a Department of Early Childhood Education or a, you know, a, a division under PED or, or some other agency that really oversees the entirety of, of what I believe to be like the ideal early childhood education service delivery model. What can be done to increase, to, I guess that's, increase isn't really the right work, word, but to take, to, to at least uh, eliminate the deficits, the, the cuts that have been done to public education oh, yeah. in, since Martinez has taken yeah, office? There's actually, there's actually two answers to that question. So what can be done to, to back, backpedal from the, from the cuts and you know, the, the lack of raise that we've had for our public school teachers and public uh, employees actually over the last eight years? Um, Fortunately, well, unfortunately or fortunately, we are in the boom of an oil and gas cycle. So uh, I actually had the privilege of serving on the budget committee and in the state legislature during an entire bust of that industry. So uh, we are now back in a boom. Uh, hopefully we can uh, use some of that new revenue. I believe there's projected to be about 700 million of new revenue, 600, 700 million of new, new dollars. The projections came out this morning, 1.2 billion okay. in new monies. All right. And in February, those projections are going to be like 1.5. Another, uh, I believe, bright spot is reading the judgment, and, and it's not the final judgment yet, uh, but the preliminary judgment of Judge Singleton, which I believe is a magnum opus, because it truly uh, doesn't take any excuses. That judgment on the Yazi case, uh, the Mal... Mal um, Maldef case, where the, you had some folks that were suing the state and saying you are not providing the constitutionally mandated sufficient public free education, appropriate education to your students. Um, the, the, uh, the plaintiffs won that case. 
and the judgment really is going to be our path forward. Mine, hopefully, as an executive, but s certainly for the legislature and the governor, um, where they will have to prioritize uh, dollars into education. And as you know, the, the Yazi versus state case, essentially plaintiffs sued the state of New Mexico and the judge determined that New Mexico has failed its constitutional duty to adequately uh, fund education, particularly for at-risk students. And the, hopefully the, what will happen as a result is we'll adequately fund it and, and then fully fund it um, and then also break down a, and eliminate the disparity of educational outcomes uh, amongst, amongst whites, Latinos, and Native students in particular. The, um, and so we're going to, uh, and oil and gas, oil and gas, to me you put oil in your car and then you put gas in the gas tank, but it's actually the, it's gas is the natural gas, as you know, the natural gas that goes into your stove, and the oil is the crude oil. It's, they, we, they call it natu oil and gas, the oil and gas. It's really the crude oil that's booming in, in southeast New Mexico. Like 95% of all the money is derived, today is deriving out of crude oil drilling, uh, horizontal drilling. And, and, uh, so, it's, uh, the, the, so you have the price of the barrel of crude oil, which, went, which bottomed out at $26 uh, three, four years ago. And now it's up to 67 and it's steady. So you have the, the price of crude oil going up and then the production. The production of crude oil is doubling and tripling down in the Artesia, Hobbs, Carlsbad area. So that's why the projections six months ago was we'd have 600 million extra. Today it's 1.2 billion. By February, when we do the budget, it's probably going to be 1.5, and it's going to be that way for the next, you know, couple, three, four years. So we we're going to have massive, massive inflows of, of cash uh, to to hope hopefully solve these massive problems that that we've been struggling with these past, you know, five, 10 years. Actually, that kind of leads into the next two questions. Um, the state's expected to have a $1.2 billion surplus. Many of those preventive education and health care measures require long-term investment and not just one-time investments. Uh, isn't now the time to focus on revenue generation, pro progressive tax structures, et cetera, so we don't rely on boom and bust oil royalties? Doesn't want me to answer because I'm running for office, but yes! <laughs> yes, yes um, absolutely, yes, um, no question about it. We have uh, the, the internet, that's why Pierce cannot win. He's taking a fifth grade no tax pledge. Um, that's just absurd. It's just like, come on. So the internet tax is approximately 50 million. Uh, the personal income tax, the, the, actually the feds lowering personal income tax on higher income affluent earners uh, allows us to do more with a progressive personal income tax. Sports betting may be a revenue stream, although maybe 20, 25 million. Medi uh, cannabis, when legalized in the next two, three years, will be an income stream as well, as well as just the growth of our economy and more importantly, closing loopholes for the super affluent and, and corporations in our in our sales tax, our gross receipts tax. So the uh, McCamley's favorite bill, uh, capital gains, you know, to raise capital gains, you know, back to a reasonable level. So we can do re revenue enhancements in addition to the crude oil boom in, in southeast New Mexico uh, so that it's steady. So when oil does fall back to 50 bucks a barrel or whatever, we still have a steady, you know, governmental structure because we're we're on the brink of a failed state. I don't, I don't think I need to, I'm not exaggerating. We, we're, two, three years ago, we literally had a failed state in, in New Mexico. And that also failed is government. the same argument. The boom and bust um, nature of the industry that we are so heavily reliant on is also the argument to diversify away from it. So in addition to revenue enhancements, which I completely, totally support 100% um, and have voted for in the state legislature, uh, I believe that it is time for a responsible transition into providing leadership around build out of renewable energy, particularly on state trust land. Um, that's not gonna be done in any one commissioner's term because that's a term limit of two four year terms, so that's eight years. You cannot build up you know, the capacity, but in that time, we can take the necessary initial steps for really not only powering New Mexico with renewable generation, but selling all of the kilowatts generated on state trust land to markets west 
And there are multiple revenue structures in, that are available to us to tie into transmission lines. Um, you know, we have the leases, of course, that we, we can have if, if we sign a lease for renewable energy, but the, but the money's not in the lease, folks. The money is creating a royalty structure around those kilowatts generated on state trust land. And eventually, um, you know, we, we may see a boom in that as well. And so that's, that's, my, um, that's my vision for the office. So is there a concern that the more money education gets from land-grant fund, the less it gets from the general fund? Oh, supplanting? There's a concern, yeah. Yeah, there, there's a concern primarily with early childhood, not for K through 12, because uh, it's just such a big portion of the budget. But, but even if we were to, even if, even if, if, we, if the constitutional amendment passed and we increased the, the funding for early childhood by 150 million, even if they offset that with other portions of government, it still would be 100, 100, 120. I mean, it's, it's a, I think it would be easier to hide that money in K through 12 than early childhood. So I think that if we were to do the early childhood, 1% for early childhood, it would go directly into early childhood because it's a smaller portion of the overall budget. It would be much more accountable and that would, that would be what the people would vote for. So, but it, it would it maybe offset, you know, five or 10% or so. So what happens in the years to come when the oil and gas, quote, run out? We will have fully fledged, empowered, educated, entrepreneurial human beings in all four <laughs> corners of the state that will have a 21st century economy <laughs> educational system with, you know, with, with fully functional families and childhood experiences and an economy that we grow instead of wait for someone to fly in and save us. Hey. <laughs> um, are there any, are there any more questions? Do our panels have any last panelists have any last comments? Yeah, if you let us close, that'd be nice. Sure. Yeah, okay. Did you have something, Cheryl? I, you may have said this and it went over my head, but what percentage of young newborn children or prenatal mothers are we actually reaching in home visiting? Uh -huh. Two to three percent, but you know, home visiting is not should not be looked upon as a silver bullet. We need to look at at child care and child care subsidies in this state, and what are we doing to help working families that that need child care, and and not even not just look at it face value, but look at what is a high quality service. A lot, of, uh, a lot of the centers out there need a lot of help and have the ability to be higher quality. I think, you know, with legislators and, and uh, policy makers, they need to look deeper at high quality and what is it and not just throw out there, we need more child care, we need more child care subsidies. We need high quality. And it's the same with home visiting. It's not just a generalized uh, service. In prevention, it's what, what does it mean to have high quality? That's what's going to make a difference. So, um, it, you know, it's very low. It's 2 to 3%. And it's not the silver bullet, but if we look at all of the different services for prenatal to 3, there's a, there's a lot of uh, attention on universal pre-K, but the brain has already had its most rapid development. Yeah, do you know what like, that statistic is for how many synapses? Not off the top of my head, but it's maybe billions. Dr. Chilton has that number. But, but that was the reason why Nurse Family Partnership was formed, because Dr. Olds said by the time a child is four years old in a pre-K program, it's too late. That family should have been helped in uh, prenatal stages and, uh, and, and during the toddler stages. There's a lot of... Uh, a lot of education, a lot of support that can happen under three. And I would urge policymakers to really promote that uh, under three and high quality. And what does it mean? It's just not adding another program and saying, oh yeah, now we're, on, we're in 21 counties. But what is, the, what is the, the quality? And one of the arguments is similar to what Stephanie was saying is that where are we gonna get the providers? Nurses love to be home visitors in NFP, and we find the home visitors. 
I mean, they have to be baccalaureate prepared nurses, and there's concern that there's not enough, but, but nurses love doing public health, and they love their, they, they form a relationship. They have about 25, each nurse has 25 families, and they form very close relationships with those families um, that, that ha and they know that they're having a lifelong impact. So you can find high quality, you can find the providers for high quality programs. And the same thing works in early childhood education. There are also states like North Carolina that have models of how you evaluate childcare programs. They have a, what they call their STAR program. And um, they've, they've figured out a way to say, this is high quality childcare and this is what we'll pay for. And if it's a low quality program, we're not gonna pay to have your kids there. So there are ways to do it. So, <laughs> well, that's. If we would actually increase it the way that it needs to be increased, are we talking about? Teachers, nurses, what other kinds of professionals? What do our, as an educator, what do our, our universities need to be gearing up to provide for this system? Oh, that's a whole nother, yeah, that's a whole nother yeah. panel. That's actually a whole nother panel. That's a whole nother panel on what we need to do in terms of improving our educational system. Yeah. But can I just briefly really say three, Okay, yeah, you, okay, you've got three things that the Legislative Education Study Committee has been working on for the past two years. It's based on a study that was done of the highest performing schools uh, in the world, and they had these three things in common. Professionalizing the teaching profession. So not only um, changing you know, the way we pay teachers, but the way we train them as well. And so we are, really, we are really trying to get the schools of education involved uh, in this reform. And uh, not only we want to recruit, like Mo said, the best and brightest of our young people to become the teachers, but then they need this great training as well, right? Um, and then we have to make sure they're qualified. And then we got to pay them for the product they're giving us. That's the other thing. That's the third thing that nobody ever talks about. We want these great trained quality educators, but we, you got to pay for that, folks. That costs money. Um, so that's number one. Number two is a universally accessible quality early childhood. And I always talk about it in those terms. I don't talk about universal pre-K. I talk about universal early childhood, quality early childhood education in New Mexico. So that's the, the second component that all of these high performing uh, schools around the, the world share. And then the third is access to robust career and technical um, education. So that's a whole different thing. You should invite Mimi Stewart to come talk about that someday. Um, but definitely that goes hand in hand with what we've been talking about today, which is mostly the funding and focusing on early childhood. This is about improving K-12, um, actually K P-20 uh, statewide. <laughs> And I think the community colleges are more apt to to do that quicker than the universities. Yeah. Um, the universities, but they all need to do it as quickly as they can. Just to wrap it up, I think um, I think with these coming elections, uh, I was bragging about all your work to Stephanie, uh, who had the misfortune of having to sit next to me for 60 straight days, eight, eight hours a day. But <laughs> um, but this corner of the world has just flipped. Uh, from a Republican corner of the world to a Democratic corner of the world, similar to Stephanie and her crew up in Los Alamos. It is now a Democratic county with a Democratic representative, Democratic county commissioners in, in what was a staunch Republican area, you know, just, just 10 years ago. Um, so we need to flick the switch, like John Arthur, uh, John Arthur Smith and, and the mentality of that we cannot control our future, that we can't shape our future. The land office, we don't want a commissioner that sits by the phone and waits for the oil guys to call, but is actually talking to, to, to solar companies, talking to wind companies, because I could set up wind and make, create electricity, but where's the market? It's complicated stuff in terms of investing, getting your product to the market. We could, uh, I mean, it's, we could, it's a question of transforming state government to do a modern 
application to our modern world. And so I think that in creating this new system of early childhood, whether we go with a secretary or put it under CYFD or PED or wherever, I mean, it's, a, it's just an incredible opportunity if we just stay engaged these next 75 days, if we stay engaged from November 6 until January 1 when the new governor takes power, we then go into session January 15, and then we, we leave the session March 15, and then we, and then we just keep building on that momentum. Um, because this, this notion of oil and gas is gonna dry up tomorrow, uh, this notion that the land grant permanent fund was created when crude oil dries up, even though the fund was created 17 years before crude oil was even discovered. I mean, I mean, the land grant permanent fund was created because the United States government didn't want to bankroll these crazy people that just became, you know, a state. And it's up to us to utilize the land grant permanent fund, in my opinion, to educate our children and to create a 21st century economy based on that education. So we will, we will continue to press on and, um, you know, and make it happen. So thank you. I want to thank each of our panelists for taking the evening to, to spend their, Can taking the time to a spend. Couple, yes. A couple minutes for just a closing statement, folks, because this is where the rubber meets the road. All the great things we talked about here tonight cannot happen unless we elect Democrats up and down the ballot. I saw Joy just walk in. She needs your help. Damon needs your help. I need your help. Michelle needs your help. And we need that not just with your vote, which we very much appreciate, but like Luann does, we need it with your phone calls. We need it with telling all of your friends and family. We need it with your financial contributions. We need it with your volunteer time. So really, that's why I came here tonight, to make a personal plea to you all to let us get this policy done with a larger majority in the legislature, a Democratic governor, and a Democratic land commissioner. Thank you. Hold on just a sec. I'd like for Joy to come up, please, if you would. This was wonderful. This, thank you all for being here. Stephanie, don't you go away yet. Just wait. Hi, I'm Joy Garrett. I've just been calling. I see about three people in the audience who have messages from me on their phone. JD, right there. Um, yeah, and I just want to add something to what Stephanie said, and that's the importance of parental education. I worked in Harrison Middle School, and that's where my student told me to run for office. And we, and some of my students that I had as fifth graders, where I currently work, Painted Sky Elementary School, they've been in the news because they don't know how to treat their kids. So along with all of the, I like the P to 20 education, we can't, we have to include home visitation for those that want it. We just have to because so many kids in our state haven't really had the advantage of being raised by parents in their home. It's just a reality that I see every day at my school. So it's a very deep, it's a very serious situation that we have to address. That's all I wanna say, but like Stephanie said, walk, fund, call, do everything. My opponent, David Atkins, won his seat by nine votes. So every time I knock on a door, I think this could be one of those nine votes. But that's true of a lot of us. So please do what you can. And do what you can doesn't even mean that you go out, you know, three times a week and lose your life and forget your family and your job to campaign. That's our job. <laughs> yes. But, yeah, my husband and me have some very exciting dates going door to door. <laughs> but... If you can, you know, volunteer for two hours, once a week or once a month, it's so inspiring. Carlene will tell you. We had three new volunteers last week. It was so inspiring. So just do what you can because if everybody does what they can, we'll win. So yes. thank you. Thank you, Joy. Thank, yes. you, so thank you very I much, Joy. So okay. first thing we have to do, get Dems elected, right? Let's all pitch in. Let's get Dems elected. Then we have the next thing, we're going to be voting on this. So let's continue to become educated, get more educated on this subject. We can use it to get people to the polls, and then we need to vote and get others to vote on behalf of it as well. So thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Mo. Thank you, Marie. This was so informative. Thank you. Have a wonderful night, everyone.
We could generate a fourth case. Okay, we have a young friend right now.